I think one of the most important things that a science education can do is not to teach pe people what is known, but how to find out what is known and uh, how to be critical and how to avoid swallowing uh, the first thing that comes into your head, how to be, how to, how to be skeptical, how to do statistical uh, um, reasoning. Um, I think the, what medical scientists now rather love, which is the double-blind control test, is a wonderful example of the right way to think. Uh, you're, they're testing one drug whether to, see, to see whether it works. So you have a drug and you have a control. And the vitally important thing is when you give some patients the drug and some pe patients the control, you, the doctor, must not know which patient has the drug and which patient has the control. That's the point of double blinding. Um, not the doctor, not the, not the nurses administering the drug, not the scientists doing the analysis afterwards are allowed to know which patient had which thing. Now, that's a wonderful discipline. It happens to be a rather simple discipline that medical scientists do, but it's wonderful to think about the significance of the double-blind control trial. I'm reading your book again, we've had uh, state education for quite some time now. Everyone is literate, so we can all read the words, but we don't seem to be treat, uh, trained to treat the words, to look at it go, oh, I wonder. Um, so we're sort of halfway there. Especially the a problem with the internet, where we can all now read stuff that has never been through any kind of gatekeeper. Uh, until the internet came along, anything that was printed had probably been through some sort of editorial control, some sort of refereeing, some sort of reviewing. Uh, and so it, it wasn't just everything out there. Now everything's out there. And one of the problems with that, of course, is the, the phenomenon of the closed bubble, where people seek out others who have the same opinion as they do. And it's an echo chamber, is another word for it, an echo chamber in which all you ever hear is people who agree with you. And that's why we get the f phenomenon of things like flat earthism, which is, uh, is being revived now. Because the flat earthers seek each other out. In our ancestral evolutionary past, we might have lived in small villages or small roving bands, where you just met 150 people or so, and those were the people you, you knew. Now, you seek out your own 150 people, anywhere in the world. This is your bubble, this is your echo chamber of flat earthers or whatever it might be. And so they reinforce each other. And you get the feeling, oh, there must be something in flat earthers because everybody I talk to seems to believe in it. And, and that's, what, that's what we're up against now. We, we've lost gatekeepers. In a way, that's a good thing. It's a nice thing that people are able to um, express their opinions without it having to go through an editor. On the other hand, it has this downside. But wouldn't it be better if those opinions were somehow rooted in knowledge? Of course, uh, and, and that's what we want to try to achieve, somehow build back critical thinking so that people say not just, this is what I hear people saying on the internet, but what's the evidence for it? What's the evidence for this? What lies behind it? Where can I look up the facts behind it? You quote Carl Sagan in your book, and there's a wonderful image that you evoke, which I knew, but your book reminded me that Carl Sagan looks at a photograph of the solar system taken, I don't know what it was, Voyager. I mean, Voyager is outside our solar system now. And it looks back at our Earth, and our Earth is one blue pixel. And he says, you know, everything you ever loved, everything you ever known is on that little blue pixel. Now, why does Vladimir Putin not get up in the morning yeah. and think that? Yeah. Why doesn't Boris Johnson think, oh, yeah. sod it, I'll tell yeah. lies, but that doesn't help yes. my little blue yeah. home. Why has it not got through? It's, it's a wonderful rhetorical piece. I, I'm sure most of you know it probably. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of poetic writing. I think Carl Sagan should have got the Nobel Prize for Literature. I mean, never mind about science. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece of poetic writing, this, this image of this pale blue dot where everything, all histories, all kings, dictators, wars and, and, and things, they just all happen on this tiny little pixel. Um, Carolyn Porco, who's I suppose the nearest approach we have today to a female equivalent to, of, to Carl Sagan, 
revive the idea. She, she was in charge of the um, photographing of the Saturn mission. So she took a photograph of Earth from Saturn, uh, again, a little tiny dot, and invited everybody on Earth to wave at the same moment um, <laughs> to try to bring home rhetorically this point that Carl Sagan had made a couple of decades before. Now, it used to be uh, that what got your goat was religion. How many of you have read The God Delusion? How many? Yes. Now, have you mellowed a bit? <laughs> <laughs> David, I'm, I'm always, hoping I not. always was mellow. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a myth, an unspeakable myth that I, I was ever... I, um, I, I, was, I was having a cup of tea with an old friend yesterday and said I was going to be talking to you. He said, oh, he's very controversial. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I can't see anything controversial in I, what you I've say. Never been, I've never been controversial. You, you, um, you, you may think it's controversial if you're deeply religious because for centuries you've been used to the idea that nobody says anything against religion. So even a very mild cautious, tentative statement against religion is heard as violent and controversial and uh, strident. Um, but actually, it's very mild. I always have been very mild. And you've, I mean, I, one of the best jobs you ever had, in my view, was the one public understanding of science. I thought that was a hugely important job. And you reveled in it, didn't you? Loved I it. did, yes. Yeah. Now, we, we sit on this planet, it's hot in here, and it's going to get hotter. The river Y down there, I don't know how spruced up it is, how much sewage gets pushed into it. Um, but it seems to me that we need science more than ever, and we need to be looking at it as a species together. So Richard, could you fix it please? The <laughs> The, the science is not in doubt. The, the problem is that when you've got the science, um, the political will to do something about it. Now, um, as an evolutionist, I know that we are the only species that has ever existed on this planet that has the gift of foresight. Uh, evolution, natural selection, doesn't give a damn about the distant future or even the middle future. It only cares about the immediate future. So natural selection favors immediate short-term benefit, short-term gain. We are the only species that has the brain power to look ahead decades, centuries, even years. We're the only species that has, the f has foresight. We can do it and some people are capable of doing it and there are voices being raised at the moment, scientific voices, political voices that do look to the future and can forecast the consequences of this action or that action for the species as a whole, for the world as a whole. That has never happened before. In a way it's a wonder, it's a blessing that even one species is capable of doing that and we are that species. So don't let's beat up on ourselves too much. I mean we, we are unique in having this ability but unfortunately only some of us have it and um, scientists on the whole are capable of telling you what's going to happen in the next decades. The problem is to get people as a whole, and that I suppose means via politicians, to take note of it and to take action not for short-term benefit but for medium and long-term benefit. And that's a difficult task. But it all, seems, it all seems to be done on feel. I mean, the Taliban in Afghanistan, how do they feel? I mean, they can't think, can they? The people in, uh, in America that are taking away all abortion rights, they can't be thinking. And, uh, and our government here, I mean, they're not brains of Britain, are they? So <laughs> what, what... Well, the I'm very moderate. The, the, f the first two you mentioned have, have their respective holy book, and so they know what's true by just reading the book. And, and that's f absolutely fatal, of course. Um, the third one you mentioned, the government, well, the problem with government is they have to get re-elected, or they want to get, to get re-elected, and so they have to pander to short-term selfishness, or they don't get re-elected. And that, that is a major problem with democracy. Democracy is wonderful, but it does have that drawback that politicians who get democratically elected have to pander to what's going to get them re-elected in the next couple of years. So short-term benefit wins out. 
So if you pander to ill-thought-out prejudice, you're likely to win. Well, ill-thought-out prejudice would be the Taliban and the religious right in America. Um, I fear the government is only too well thought out. I mean, we want to win the next election, and so and so, um, the um, what economists call the shadow of the future is very short. I'm going to change tack, or else um, I'll be written up in the Daily Mail. Um. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.